Great. Welcome to Bangalore International Center. I think we usually start with a request to just put your phones on silent uh, if you have them on. So um, it's with immense pleasure that I'm here today to introduce Vikramaditya Prakash. It's wonderful to have him in Bangalore, and I've no doubt that his talk is going to be thoroughly engaging and challenging in the best possible way. My collaborators and I have had the pleasure of speaking with Vikram um, over the past few years and sharing our own work on the Chandigarh furniture. And his thinking has really deeply resonated with our approach as well. So I'm very much looking forward to joining you today to listen to Vikram uh, speak directly to um, the furniture's history um, and how we might locate that in conversation with the city's spatial dimensions and with art. By way of uh, a short introduction to Vikram's talk today, I'd like to return briefly to the first paragraph in the synopsis for his talk, in which he says, Indian modernism, like much mid-century modern architecture worldwide, is under threat today, being variously erased, revised, and reimagined. Is it still relevant? Do its aesthetics, and more importantly, its ethics and ideals, still have something to offer? Or should we museumize a few representative examples and send the rest on their way to dusty implosion? So, um, by the kind invitation of Vikram, I'd like to spend a moment to connect uh, this with some of the work that my collaborators, Petra Seitz and Gregor Wittrich and I, have been doing, analyzing um, a great deal of auction data, some th uh, 1,000 um, records, um, and I think provides a little bit of context for um, the furniture that we'll hear about today, um, and in particular, this notion of erasure, revision, and reimagination. As three design historians, we, were, we approached the Chandigarh furniture out of curiosity, really. Uh, we were curious about how this furniture had skyrocketed in popularity and financial value and gained global fame. There was a clear connection to India, where I live and work, but it wasn't clear how this furniture was connected to Indian modernism or Indian design histories more broadly. We didn't need to look very far to find some pretty unequivocal answers to this question uh, and to this curiosity. The narrative that we were presented with, and which many of you will no doubt be quite familiar, credited the furniture as almost exclusively the work of either Le Corbusier or Pierre Jean Ray, his cousin. So much fo so, in fact, that uh, the work uh, that we, we often see typically the furniture is referred to as Jean Ray furniture or Jean Ray chairs. We were told that the city of Chandigarh had been indifferent to them and that they were at risk of total destruction before French antiques dealers traveled to Chandigarh in the late 90s, discovered and saved them, bringing them their due appreciation on the international fine art market. We were told literally and through images used to present the furniture at auction and in the popular press um, that these were aesthetically valuable for their sculptural forms, perfectly suited to high-end domestic interiors. So our work over the last few years has focused on unpacking this narrative, looking critically at who created and supported it, um, and why and through what mechanisms, and has revealed a great deal, I think, about the erasure, revision, and reimagining that Vikram sets out in the synopsis for this talk. So what has been erased with respect to the furniture? Well, quite a lot, um, but let's be begin with use. Uh, that this furniture was designed as economical, functional, municipal furniture that would be mass manufactured, and that it has remained in use, um, some of it, in Chandigarh until uh, the point of its so-called discovery, and that in fact much furniture remains in use in Chandigarh today, has been almost um, entirely erased from the current popular narrative as it revises and reimagines the furniture's history for a new market. Secondly, the understanding that the furniture was designed within an office of practitioners and manufactured in multiple workshops the context of collective design and production has been almost completely erased, rarely mentioned in auction listings, books, or news articles. Now widely uh, accepted coding system that, is, uh, that was originally created by the dealers uh, who first removed furniture from Chandigarh and is now generally used to identify furniture types at auctions, this coding exclusively uses the initials of Le Corbusier and uh, Pierre Jean Ray. 
So this erasure we've suggested uh, in our work is part of a, a broader Eurocentric revision of the furniture as a singular, uh, or rather as the singular work of a master designer. What was once understood as functional furniture, um, functional objects of use within Chandiga is now understood as the European design work of Swiss-French architect Pierre Jean Array. This, coupled with the furniture's aesthetic, uh, contributes to the furniture now being found in auctions such as Swiss design, and most recently in February this year, French design. And finally, this placement on the international market illuminates the reimagination of this functional mass manufactured furniture as art. This everyday municipal furniture is now foremost, uh, foremost heralded for its aesthetic qualities. Pieces are treated as objects of rarity, even where the ex exact quantities of furniture are actually elusive still. Seemingly identifiable authentic originals are singled out from later reproductions or so-called uh, copies and fakes. And as already uh, mentioned, the furniture is positioned as part of the oeuvre single master genre. So this is all criteria borrowed from the art market system of high financial value, the mechanisms through which a university library table can sell for over $300,000. So for us, in the context of the furniture, we can put, push back against the erasure, revision, and reimagination of the furniture by resisting and challenging the art market's framework of financial value located in aesthetics, authorship, and rarity, and by focusing on other forms of value through histories of production and use. And based on this, we can rethink what it might mean to preserve Chandigarh's modernist design. And I believe this is, uh, that it's this final point um, on preservation, about locating preservation in future practice that Vikram will uh, touch upon today. So with this, I'd like to introduce Dr. Vikram Aditya Prakash. Vikram is a professor of architecture at the University of Washington, Seattle, with adjunct uh, appointments in landscape architecture, urban design, and planning and digital arts and experimental media, and was recognized as an ACSA Distinguished Professor in 2021. He is host of the excellent podcast, Architecture Talk, which I'd very much recommend. Um, and he is co-design lead of the Conceptual Design Practice Office of Uncertainty Research, whose work I believe that he's, he'll be drawing on today. Uh, he, uh, his books include Chandigarh's Le Corbusier, The Struggle for Modernity in Postcolonial India, the architect, um, Architecture of Shivdat Sharma, Chandigarh, An Architectural Guide, and he's co-editor of Colonial Modernities, Rethinking Global Modernism, Architectural Historiography in the Postcolonial, and A House Deconstructed. In 2020, his book, One Continuous Line, Art, Architecture, and Urbanism of Aditya Prakash was released, and I believe that this talk is gonna pick up from some aspects of that project as well. Vikram's forthcoming book, Le, Corbusier, uh, Le Corbusier's Chandigarh, Preservation as Future Modernism, will be published by Routledge UK in the fall of 2023. And with this, I'd like to invite Vikram uh, up to the stage. Thanks, Thea. <clears throat> well, thank you, Nia, for a wonderful introduction and the sort of uh, intellectual grounding of many of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. It's, uh, uh, it's such an incredible pleasure to be here in this beautiful building and to be a part of this uh, fantastic community here in Bangalore. Actually, this is, the very, I think, the very first time I'm speaking in Bangalore. Maybe I spoke once before. I don't know how I have uh, uh, missed this on the circuit, but now I think I've heard recently the Delta is starting a straight Seattle-Bangalore flight, so uh, please keep the invitations coming because I'm, I'm done with uh, some of with Delhi, and you know, it's like traffic. Okay, anyway. So, uh, uh, you know, essentially, uh, uh, it, it, it may come across uh, that the, the presentation that I'm doing is uh, uh, about preservation, and it is about preservation. Uh, but I'm not a trained professor of preservation as such. I have sort of backed my way into it. 
And I approach this much more from a theoretical and intellectual perspective and a conceptual thinking practice uh, perspective and much more uh, from a, a, a how to think about certain things differently perspective. So I don't really have a beef with the more traditional ideas and notions of practice based on resilience and sustainability. Rather, I'm trying to unpack a new modality for thinking the past in a way that is future oriented. Thinking preservation more as a managing change practice uh, rather than a, a, a resilience practice. And I think those two are not incompatible ideas, and perhaps we can take that up in, in our conversation. Uh, and basically, I'm arguing uh, that, that the past is, is a sort of a future making practice uh, and, and, uh, and not something that has to be radically othered from development and differentiation, which is the traditional modernist perspective on how to think about preservation. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, you know, I started this work uh, about a decade ago uh, when uh, I'm born and brought up in Chandigarh and my father, you know, worked, uh, 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 was an integral part of the city. Uh, as Chandigarh came under the effects of globalization, uh, as everywhere else, we were confronted with these kind of drawings and maps. And essentially, the project that we took up was how, working with my students, was how to think about this change. You know, how do we build in a manner that accounts for the tremendous growth uh, that is projected for a city like Chandigarh? And our basic rationale at that time was that what we need to do is to build vocabularies uh, that counter sort of simple globalist narratives uh, of cut pasting something from Singapore, but build on the DNA of the architectural and urban vocabulary and systems of the modernist city for better and for worse, and to do things differently. Uh, coming from Seattle, which is the Pacific Northwest, which you know, I don't know how many of you may be familiar, you know, we are super ultra sustainable and organic and food, for, food uh, you know, uh, food forests and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the moment we sort of set ground and all my students got to work, immediately, you know, we had animal husbandry, integrated villages, reserved forests, gray water recharge, courtyard housing. You know, we got to work, put all this down, and came up with what we thought were kind of cool schemes, uh, along with a fantastic model made out of uh, spices and things like that, and fantastic graphics, which we tried to rethink some of Mr. Doshi's uh, uh, kind of uh, multi-perspectival representational drawings, such as those in Jaipur, and presented that to the local community. And basically, all our work seemed to fall on deaf ears. Uh, because it turns out that the entire local conversation was dominated by the question of preservation, right? Uh, Chandigarh was being nominated for the UNESCO World Heritage, you know, as part of Le Corbusier's oeuvre, which you know about. Uh, uh, but certainly, the emotion, so, so there was that Corbusier discussion of how to put the city uh, on the World Heritage list, which, uh, which the Corbusier people were pushing really hard. The Brasilia was the example. The whole point was to put the whole city down. And administration was pushing back because real estate prices in Chandigarh are absolutely through the roof. Uh, my parents' house in Chandigarh is worth more than the house, my house in Seattle, which made no sense to me because Chandigarh has no manufacture and no industry, whereas in Seattle we have Amazon, Starbucks, Microsoft, Boeing, Nordstrom, you know, just keep naming it. So where is all this money coming from? Uh, so anyway, that was the conversation. But the emotional affect of the entire conversation was taken over by this discussion about chairs. You know, how is it this sort of a colonialist narrative that was put into place, the city that sat on its treasures but did not know them, that's New York Times, can you believe it? Uh, suggesting that, you know, what is, that, 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 the, that the modern Indian uh, imagination doesn't care about the uh, patron, patronage of, of the uh, great white masters. Uh, and, it, you know, things that are trash can easily be sold for 48,000 which was an argument that really came home to me when, uh, when I saw this, these things over there. Uh, those are chairs being sold as Pierre Genere, uh, but those are actually uh, from a building called Tagore Theater, which was designed by my father. Uh, and here is an image of his handmade drawing on the wall where he did a full-size study of how the chair is to be made, and that's the chair on the left uh, in use. Uh, and I was very excited to go to Phantom Hands and sort of get a sense that I was back in my old dad's shop, you know, uh, making full-size mock-ups. 
but, but, but here they were uh, somehow uh, on the auction block uh, being showed as Pierre. So uh, I started an investigation you know, into that uh, and, 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 we, and I found out that essentially it, this is the theater uh, and, 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 and the plan of the building, the, you know, which, which that's a great photograph, uh, historic photograph, which my dad put together, had him designing the interior of the building based on a hugely high modernist technical obsession on questions of aesthetics, orientation, accessibility, uh, uh, optimum sizes, you know, it's kind of an auditorium of uh, double the size, but was a thing that was completely interiorly focused around that, around which in the end he had wrapped a wrapper, okay? It just needed a wrapper in the end, and he put this. For some reason, the local administration decided, or at least this is what they said, that they needed a bigger auditorium, and what they did was they gutted the entire interior out, and kept the wrapper and put some glass on it to make an argument, Now, which is a standard preservation argument. You keep the external facades of buildings and you evacuate the center, all right? But they missed the sort of DNA of design, I thought, in the, in the making of that. And in the production of that process, of course, they ended up transforming this, uh, you know, pulled out the chairs, which were, you know, put out into the streets, and then uh, through that process, finally end up on the auction block. So here we are. This was the problem set that I was confronted with. You know, there is this city that's growing at this scale. There's a sort of an architectural design logic which is sort of not really working and not really internalized, or is it internalized? And it comes down to the level of the chairs. And this is how I backed myself into this conversation saying, okay, I can't just go in and you know, cut paste some amazing Seattle solutions here although I still believe in most of the principles that we talk about over here. We've got to find a way to work our way through the thicket of a preservation logic, but something that's directed towards producing a future, remembering in some ways the core dictum of Chandigarh, which was always a future-oriented city. So how can preservation as in continued Indian modernism be a future practice uh, 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 differentiated from the uh, uh, sort of, uh, and we can have a conversation, robust conversation around 50, 1950s, 60s preservation, which is very alive, not only in Chandigarh, India, but around the world, as probably all those of your architects would know well. So I'll present to you uh, three uh, essentially collaborative case studies. Uh, one is very conceptual, uh, the second is very pragmatic, which is the one with, on the furniture, and I'll end with a couple of slides of a possible idea I have for the future. So the first, uh, we, uh, with, 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 I have this concept, and Nina talked about our conceptual practice called Ecology, uh, Office of Uncertainty Research. Uh, and, and we were looking at uh, this problem. We were asked to sort of respond to this problem. At one time in Chandigarh, there was Tata Housing came up with this brilliant idea to make a housing block over here. Now, if you can read the plan, that's Chandigarh. Uh, and that is the capital complex. Uh, and in the standard logic, so if that's the capital complex, they are basically trying to put a huge housing estate, which looks, was proposed as something like this, to be right next to the capital complex, for which we, I did a quick and dirty collage to say, that will be your new elevation uh, imposed onto the Capuzier vision. Of course, everybody, like, well, at least the architectural community, thank God, you know, took two arms. You know, and, and, and a great friend of mine, Max Reen, uh, working with the, uh, basically the legal community in town, took this up and went to the Supreme Court and won the case to stop it. But they did not win the case on scope or visual grounds. This argument did not hold with the Supreme Court of India, not neither with the Punjab and Haryana High Court and nor with the Supreme Court of India because they said, it's not protected. Who says you can't build in the certain visual corridor of the capital complex? Eh, it's good for development. But they were able to hold the argument on an ecological ground. As it happened, right next to the capital complex, over here, there is a lake, a man-made lake, that has been built by damming these two rivers. 
Chandigarh was made in the heydays of the 1950s and 60s. Making dams was the name of the game. Bakranangal Dam was about 80 kilometers away. And producing a dam was what the engineers could do well. And they did it. And Pierre Genre loved it, and Cabuzier supported it. And it became a, it is, even till this day, I, a, a, an incredible, incredible amenity. The moment I reached back to Chandigarh 10 days ago, first thing I did was go to the lake and spend one hour you know, meditating. I'm back home. You know, it's, it's just a beautiful place. So they won the argument on the grounds that uh, the uh, catchment of Sukhna Lake was going to be threatened by this development. You know? And it's, it's, it's a complex argument. I'm not sure how scientifically, how absolutely rigorous it is. Uh, but they won that, and what they had done, they won that. I thought that this is an interesting thing. And we started to look at the hydrology of the city. And as you start to zoom out, you see that the Chandigarh site being located where it is belongs to a very complex and fragile ecology, which is not based on the big rivers of the Ganga and the Yamuna and the Kaveri and Saraswati you know, and so on, but is based on a very local water system. And this local water system is actually at the very foothills of the furthermost rain of the, uh, of the Aravalis, you know, over here, these are the furthermost rains of the Aravalis, and these are what are called erosion hills, that these hills are formed of erosion that has come down of the Himalayas over the last 60, 70 million years, all right? So what that basically sets up is that the conditions of the lake, which I love this model that, uh, uh, that was made in, by, by the Chandigarh team from the archives, which shows that this minor low dam is set up to resist a millennial process of erosion where the silt over here, underneath the great Indo-Gangetic plain, is almost a kilometer high. So uh, long story short, as we know from the big dams, not only in the, in the central and south India, but certainly if you go to Bhakra and you go to many of the dams of the north, this is a doomed proposition from, from the beginning. All right? Already Bhakra is about halfway full of silt, uh, and this lake is, is going to silt up, and this wonderful lake that we have, as is shown from the ecological diagrams, is set up to, uh, in, in, in the not too near future, uh, be filled with sediments and will close up over here. So, whatever the argument that the Supreme Court accepted, we were interested in the sort of error of making the lake. In a sense, the entire dam was a kind of a productive error. And what that produced for us was the notion that this will result actually not too distant future, it could be 50 years, it could certainly be 500 years. But if we take an ecological perspective, this is going to be silted over. And one of the things that might happen out of this is the production of trees. And we took that idea and said, well, wouldn't it be interesting to actually have a complete ecology of replanted trees? Because if you remember, the entire Gangetic Plain was at one time a dense, 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 dense forest. So when we talk of an agricultural landscape, it is in the ecological scale a, 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 a deforested landscape. And one of the great uh, outcomes of the Chandigarh experience is that it has resulted in a massive amount of reforestation of the area. And wouldn't it be possible, wouldn't it be interesting to take, uh, uh, take, take a future vision about this modernist thing and think about this site as a site where animals, humans, birds, trees, fauna, we could move towards a kind of what we call post-human modernism, uh, something that's not anti-modernism, but kind of a productive post-human modernism. So that's the basic argument. And just to have fun, I will show you a little triptych that we did. We took this sort of a famous Cabusian uh, uh, landscape, with sort of an ideal space, merged it uh, with a series of migration drawings by Julie Merutu. Uh, I'll just run through these as visual candy. Uh, uh, and and uh, basically uh, ended up at this, this triptych 
which, you know, if you're, if you're an art historian, you'll immediately pick up, is a reading of the Garden of Earthly Delights in, in a certain way, uh, picks up on the core idea of, of uh, the capital as a landscape, picks on the Garden of Earthly Delights, and produces a vision of a post-human vision in, in the sense uh, all the way to the end. And uh, I've put this up here basically because we are exhibiting, exhibiting this in, uh, in Venice uh, starting in May to November. So if you are planning to visit the Biennale, uh, the architecture Biennale, please come see our installation in the Palazzo Bembo. I'm very excited about it. So, so rethinking the past, rethinking modernism, rethinking even the errors of modernism, and trying to convert them into a productive future practice is, I think, then the way of doing thinking past as future. It's not a straight line. It's not the simple review of you know, uh, heritage as something that you have to bow down to or radically reject or, 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 or do. You know, we have to continually engage it in a productive, designerly manner. And some of the best preservation faculty that I know of also think of, uh, think of it in this way. Which would then bring me to case study number two, which is my fantastic uh, collaboration with uh, Deepak Srinath and his team here uh, in Bangalore with collaboration uh, with Phantom Hands. So uh, that started uh, with, with a different journey. Uh, my father died in 2008. Uh, and I suddenly was in a, faced with this mountain of material he left in his usual disorganized manner, uh, which I eventually finally, you know, was able to, or at least all his architectural stuff was able to uh, uh, give to the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. But he was an architect, he was a planner, he was a designer, he was a furniture maker, he was a painter, he was a sculptor, he was an academic, he's a theater person, he was a poet and a theorist. Okay, think about the weight of all that on my head as I try to grow up as a son. I, you know, it's, it's a disaster. Uh, so I wrote a book about it, uh, uh, which is available outside. Please buy one. Uh, and, and, and I entitled the book One Continuous Line, which refers in part to uh, this, uh, his obsession with the continuous line. His artwork, he was really wanted to move the line around forever to see whatever it could do. So, you tell me what's the emotional charge behind that. But it also refers to you know, this, this kind of, uh, he was trying to, I argue in the book, look for the line that connects, or not connects, that threads, that links, that weaves together, that moves things that appear to be very disparate and even inimical and antithetical in their goals and objectives. How do you sort of thread them together? And I just put gesturally this image up of one of his paintings and a section of a theater that he designed called Neelam, where his obsession with acoustics, you know, sort of is, is, is a narrative about how to uh, do this. I mean, I, I, I suggest uh, that, uh, that uh, so uh, that, that, that section is a painting, if you like. It's a, it's a well-regarded idea in a lot of uh, formalist kind of readings of the production of aesthetic uh, objects. Uh, one of the most interesting things for me in putting this book together was to study his work with Cabusier. Uh, like, how did he do this work of continuing, you know, a, a learning? Uh, most importantly, he worked with Cabusier on this building called the School of Art, which he wrote about in, in Architecture Plus Design, uh, and made a series of diagrams, and here is basically the plan and section of it. I'm not going to go again into it in great detail. The interesting thing is that uh, on the left is the uh, School of Art. That's it. Uh, on the right is the School of Architecture. In 1961, my father was given the charge of designing the College of Architecture. And he convinced Pierre and everybody that when Cobb was doing the School of Art, he was actually every, doing the School of Architecture. So we really need to cut paste the job. But the problem was as follows. The budget for the College of Architecture was less than the budget of the School of, Archi of, 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 the School of Art. So he had an option that he could either phase the building, you're going to make one part and let the other occur, or he could shrink the building. Because materials is, in those days, 
basically 95% of the cost. Labor, land was nothing, labor was very cheap. So simply by reducing the amount of material, he could do the entire building for less. But how do you shrink a co-op building? How do you shrink a co-op design? You can't just put it into a photocopier, all right? Even if you had a photocopier at that time. He got into this whole business of studying the modular. I'm hoping most of this audience knows what the modular is, basically a system proportions based on the golden section, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, two squares, uh, which Cobb put a whole uh, ethos into. And the concept basically was that if you shrink down buildings, uh, you, know, you, could, uh, you, you could step down between levels. So if you want to shrink down, you go from here to here. You can't go in the middle. I thought, OK, that's fine. It's just doing a corb faithful. Until I found this drawing. And this is such a weird drawing. He calls it variations to modular dimensions. All right? And I found that what was happening over here was that since the modular was based on kind of golden proportion and this abstract things, whereas Indian buildings, at least at that time in Chandigarh, were all built on multiples of the three inch brick. To make buildings based on modular, you had to adjust the modular so it was always a multiple of three inches. So you introduced, he introduced into the entire system an error, but an error that was productive. And while he was at the job of producing a productive error, I'm calling it error because I could hear the kabuziyawalas, you know, saying, oh, you know. But you're getting the argument. This is what, 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 what I'm arguing about. While he was at it, he says, some dimensions which do not find their place in either may be usefully included. He even created a series of new dimensions which he's put in this diagram, which have absolutely nothing to do with the modular, but which he, he thinks come from the modular, but are actually his dimensions. And when you look at his buildings, 90% of the major dimensions that he used in all his buildings were these buildings. So that's the argument. I thought that that was a fantastic thing, so that this section became a fascinating thing for me, where it is a reading of how one takes an original and one transforms it through half inch increments and transformations, which then produce new things in, in, in a certain way, uh, which are as faith, which, which can both claim a certain kind of fidelity and yet at the same time be something else. So this was the concept that I took, and then we started to start, start to apply it to the furniture. We started to document it all and see you know, how it might be done. Uh, and very quickly, we started to come upon the idea that it has, you know, it, uh, you know if one is going to go, go down to the half inch level uh, in the furniture, you know, it very quickly becomes down to manufacturing and making, at which point the most miraculous thing happened that, uh, uh, you know, phantom hands, uh, walked into the world, and, and we started this collaboration. Uh, and, and basically, I feel, uh, you know, I'll show you the process of the conversation we had. Here are the original chairs, which I have now here in Seattle. You know, I make these measurements, sort of they're very crude, then I take pictures, then I take videos, and then they come over here, and, and Deepak Steam transforms them into measurements over here, try, makes 3D models, and makes various prototypes. We talk about it every time, and we keep improving it. Even yes, just now talk, sitting outside, I was thinking, oh, I got to tell Deepak about making this angle a little different, you know, da, 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 da. Uh, they tried many different materials. Uh, and, and I love this slide, which, which they got to send, you know, modified seat, original design, modified seat moved forward by an inch, modified, original, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I can tell that the ethic of working in sort of producing these these chairs over here in Phantom Night is very much about fidelity to a certain kind of a origin. But what is most interesting and what actually makes it most critical and I think most uh, uh, useful and I would argue marketable in the world is the changes and transformations that are put into place to make it into a future-oriented chair. This is very different. This is very different from what the what the, what the French are doing, or French and the New Yorkers and the Chicago people 
who completely change the chair. You know, they, they add new material to it. Well, you know, uh, and they, they make it completely usable, but sell it as an original, right? So you fake it. They fake it. And, I, and what I'm trying to argue over here is that this is when it's not presented as the original with its sort of certain kind of signage on it. It becomes a practice of moving into the future through half in increments where the process of transforming these chairs is not that different from the process of, uh, of what is uh, uh, being done in, uh, uh, in the... Uh, uh, in, in, in the kind of work that I found in the, my father's reading of Cabusier and his heritage and his inheritance, all right? So that's fundamentally the argument that I'm trying to make over here, is that as we move from the past and into the future, as we think about preservation as something that moves into the forward, you know, it's not a unilaterality. It's a process by which you sort of mine and work with the past, with the idea of fidelity, because that's the key thing about preservation. But when you move it into the future, it must be done in a manner that preserves a certain way of working that moves with time in a manner that both goes back and forward, but that has an eye towards the right and that has an eye towards the left, which works in many different dimensions in many different ways. So uh, I, I just want to you know, uh, 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 basically uh, end by showing uh, one, uh, one final project that we are trying to do over here, uh, which is a collaboration with my friend uh, Jorge Otero. Uh, when my, my, since my father was an artist, uh, I haven't shown you his artwork, but he was an extensive artist, you know, a, lot of, uh, a, a huge archive. Uh, this is a picture of his studio, and uh, let me see, how do I, I'm hoping, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the room where he painted, since he was a very frugal person, over th a 30 year period as he was painting in it every day, whatever paint was left over on his brush, he would take that paint and he would put it on the walls. So he would add layers and layers and layers and here's this, all these walls covered with, with, with paint. And that's, that's this uh, uh, amazing sort of LiDAR animation that we were able to make. I was able to make with my friend Ishan in like 15 minutes. It's amazing, this technology that we can use. So it's a fantastic space. Uh, uh, and although uh, artwork is movable, you know, what do I do with this? Right? This is the problem that I have. Uh, and maybe you all have some ideas. I really don't have very good ideas. But, uh, no, no, I have a very good idea. But maybe there are other ideas and we can have a dialogue about this. So here it is. Uh, I'm showing you the elevations, and I was showing you this, showing this set of elevations and drawings to a really good friend of mine called Jorge Otero. <coughs> and Jorge Otero Pilots, well, I'll show you this first, is the director of the preservation project program at Columbia University. Uh, but besides being uh, a professor of preservation, he is an artist uh, in, in, in his own right, and he talks about this thing which he calls the ethics of, du ethic of, ethics of dust. And basically, the project that he talks about is that he, one of the key things that preservation people are asked on to do in a very, very technical manner is to clean buildings, all right? So, for instance, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, his, his uh, uh, Trajan's Column, uh, the plaster cast of Trajan's Column in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And he, his task was to clean it. How does he clean it? There's, I actually don't know fully, but basically it's a latex. You apply the latex as a, as a, as a fluid, as a sort of a paste. You wait for it to dry, and at the correct time, in the correct way, you simply basically peel it off. And when you peel it off, if all your consistencies are correct, all the dust, quote unquote, dust will come out and quote unquote, the original structure will be returned to its original. For those of you who might remember the entire controversy, for instance, about the cleaning of the Sistine ceiling in the, uh, in, in the Vatican. 
But that is where Jorge begins his work. He does this first part as a technical person, but his, he as an artist come, comes into play in the second part where what he does is he takes these dust panels that have come up and he presents them as histories, as critical, important histories. You know, for instance, if you go to Westminster Hall and he was in some factories, you know, this is evidence of a deep history. And he produces them, puts them up, installs them, lights them up, and, and has a very successful practice around it. And I was talking to Hore and I said, what are we gonna do about this thing over here? You know, that's not about cleaning. I, I just, you know, can you help me save it? Uh, and basically he said, well, why don't we lift it? Why don't we sort of use the same technique and see what happens if we pick it up. Now it's purely experimental, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, but the idea basically is that if we take something like this, which is what he originally did, our hope is that somehow, and it could be a complete disaster, uh, uh, my hope is that, uh, uh, that, it will in, 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 uh, that it will bring not just the dust, but it will bring the artwork from the wall up with it. But in doing so, the new artwork will no longer be the original artwork. It will be a new artwork which has a certain past life, which has gone through the very specific filter of preservation. It's a very technical job. But in the end, produces something completely new. All right? It's not just a conceptual redoing, which I love to but produces, it's a reading of doing preservation in a manner where the past becomes a production of, of the future. Uh, we had a lot of fun at 1 a.m. last night and, and, and we thought that uh, you know, maybe uh, this is what it might look like if we were uh, really, really lucky. Uh, so uh, you, you can decide that, uh, whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, so, uh, that's basically what I have, uh, I'm trying to make the argument that we have to think about preservation as a future-oriented practice, which includes in specific the world of modernism, which, because modernism was always a productive way, not, not a, a sort of a future-oriented, uh, constructive way of thinking. It doesn't lend itself naturally to the idea of the ancient past, but that is in some ways an asset, which is an idea of heritage, which I think needs to be put into place alongside simply continuing uh, the best and worst of modernism if we, are to, if, we are, if we are to sort of think about the future uh, in a continued modernist way and not have to always rely on, all right, we gotta leave that behind and do something completely different. That's it, uh, thank you very much. And now, okay. Yeah. I think we now have a conversation. See? Yeah, great. Uh, so thank you very much for that um, really illuminating talk. I find this part absolutely fascinating myself and uh, my collaborators were really interested in the idea of sort of preservation and conservation in Chandigarh from the perspective of, of just everything that's still there and, and what do you do not with these individual pieces as it's sometimes kind of suggested at auction that you know just a few things sort of remain but the idea that there's actually a huge amount of, of functional furniture still in use and, and what do you do with that do you sort of lock up the whole lot and, and is there a way of kind of preserving through use so this I, I thought was really fascinating um, I, I come very much from a design history background, um, and, and that's sort of how I come to, to this project. And so I suppose that's a sort of caveat to my questions, returning us for a moment to the uh, furniture, um, and then I think we'll open up to audience questions, and I think we can come back to the, um, the, the city and, uh, and this project as well. Um, so I want to 
to begin um, with a question around authorship. Um, and I think uh, you've highlighted on a number of occasions, uh, and we very much agree, that uh, there are problems when it comes to assigning authorship um, to, to, the, to the Chandigarh um, furniture. And you've said that um, everyone on Jean Array's team and the craftspeople who built them had a role to play in designing and making the furniture for the city, other than as copyists and draftsperson. I think that was in uh, Phantom Ham's interview. Mm. Um, and we very much agree, as I said. Um, but I'm, so I'm interested in the context of thinking about um, future practice and preservation. How might we think about authorship in this um, in this uh, in this scenario? And as a kind of add-on to that, uh, I'm particularly interested in how you're considering it in the collaboration with Phantom Hands, and and maybe we might want to think about that word collaboration, whether that's the right word. Mm. So I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Nia. Uh, <clears throat> author, authorship's a great, great topic to be discussing in this context, right? Now, uh, already in literature, there's a lot of work if you read books and you read attributions in museums and exhibitions, and for instance, you know, authorship is already expanded, even for, you know, Cabusier works, if you like, you know, there is always mention of his chief collaborators, right? So we already have some of that idea. And that certainly is a complicated notion when one talks about a, a colonial and post-colonial situation, all right? So, for instance, the production of the furniture is, for marketing purposes, attributed up to Cabusier and Pierre Jeanneret because that's what is going to somehow sell it. Uh, and it radically uh, works to erase the uh, Indian collaborators, if that's the right word. But one of the things is that all this furniture was not, you know, even strictly authored by even Pierre Jeanneret, and certainly not by Cabusier at all. Uh, it was done in the offices by numerous people on the team, uh, simply as one of the things you did as part of your routine. I mean, my father would talk about it, that you, know, you made the buildings in the morning, and you know, then you had them redraft, put them out for drafting in the afternoon. And it was only in the evening after dinner and scotch that you went out to the furniture, and you know, just, did, just kind of did the furniture alongside, basically because that was the cheapest way to furnish the buildings. To buy something off the catalogs in the 1950s, 60s was so much more expensive. So they designed, and everybody designed and built the furniture and just put it in. And they were made by the thousands in, in basically reasonably cheap uh, ways. So even in doing that, a lot of, since they had to be made quickly and fast and very, very cheaply, the craftsmen were sig heavily authored the chairs. So, so I say all this, A, this is just the first part of the, my, my response is that basically to say that in particular in the chairs and uh, you know, the idea of authorship, it's sort of singular attribution up to the white colonial master modernist chair up to Pierre and Genere is a sort of a fantastic, unbelievable instance of neocolonialism which uh, you know, needs to be un undone. Having said that, I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, this idea of, uh, so, okay, so we undo the, uh, you know, the und which, which is kind of the first move, is to sort of undo uh, traditional uh, uh, attributions. But the second part of this move, from my perspective, has to be to produce a new conception of authorship altogether, all right? If one is going to say that the making of design being part of a flowing stream of creativity and thinking, which you call modernism or whatever you want to call it, we all work within certain legacies and traditions and ways of doing things. And to be work within a flowing river where all creativity is inevitably part of that river and contribute as much contributes to that river as it, is, as, it, as it derives from, 
requires a different notion of authorship, mm. which cannot rely on the singular, you know, uh, 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 the unified subjectivity of a single author hero, or no, not even a hero. So we need to move to a different notion of authorship, which is, I think, a fantastic opportunity. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure I can fully, um, uh, what would be such a differentiated notion of authorship is not something I can you know, spell out right now. But I think it's very much in the, uh, in certain sort of uh, literary and structuralist histories, uh, theories, which you can, you know, one can start thinking about it, but just hasn't come to art and architecture as much as it should. Uh, but it, it be can become a way to think about practice. And uh, where I was trying to take this is that it's maybe just a happy coincidence that the chairs cannot be, uh, I'm told they are not copyrighted. I'm told there is no authorship, that, that nobody's jumping up and down in courts to say, oh my God, this belongs to Punjab government or, or whatever. I don't know what, let's say that's all true. I think that's a fortuitous happening which offers us the opportunity to think about these chairs in this open-ended authorship manner. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I want to open up to audience questions and then we can kind of circle back. I'm sorry my answers well. are so long. <laughs> Please. Um, but I, I'm going to sort of ask another question that, again, comes very much from our yeah. research and then sort of hands over to the audience and perhaps we'll come back. Um, but I wanted, as I said, we're, as I said in my introduction, we're particularly interested in, in use and, um, and use in specifically in relation to the furniture. Um, we're three design historians really coming at this um, through that lens. Um, and in your talk, you've sort of articulated three aspects of Indian modernism in furniture, in architecture, and art. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how the different uses of these categories change, perhaps changes the way or may change the way about how we think about preservation. I would like to think that the use should not be the originator of the future preservation practice. We inherited a lot of our preservation theory from art history 19th century, right? I mean, there's a certain history that comes down that and those, a lot of those practices got passed on to architecture and so on. But if we, but in the, in the, if you want, the modernist mold, where, which was always multidisciplinary, which may at certain registers have always been looking for a Gesamtkunstwerk, a complete work. That's one way to look at it. You know, Van der Velde, Art Nouveau, da 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 da, all that sort of complete work kind of tradition. But there is a vast and amazing, and I think central modernist tradition, even if you take somebody like Cabusier, uh, where it's not about a singular work, but it is about, as I was trying to say in my father's work, that it is about the uh, translations and entanglements, to use the contemporary theory word, the sort of uh, dis-dash connections, connections that are disconnections. Uh, between things, that is critical. So for if, if one goes with that perspective, I would argue that what matters is not the format or the origin or the scale, but what matters is the trajectory of the argument. So for instance, in that scale of the, of the, of the urban, uh, you know, which I presented a short snippet for. I mean, in, my, in the book that's coming out in September, I have a complete, you know, I, I, what I do is I have a whole section where I reread the Cabusian plans through this new insight and see how we can think the Cabusian plans in an ecological future-oriented way. Uh, so it's, it's a way of doing things 
which can result in many different outcomes and practices rather than something that's indexed, I would argue, to a particular uh, scale, format, or discipline. Thank you. Well, we'll open up to some uh, questions from the audience, and then we can come back around. Thank you. Um, you touched upon uh, the first topic that you spoke uh, about ecology, and uh, I would be interested to know a little more about it because it was a clean sort of generalization on just trees and making forests, whereas, uh, you know, wetlands and grasslands and all those also contribute a lot to ecology. So just taking a lake and making it into trees is not something which I, 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 I feel there has to be something more than that. There has to be, there has to be something more than that. And that's exactly what I, I just referred to, I know. There's a complete section in between about uh, how, how such a process might take place. And, uh, and, and what are the ways in which we might start reading the plans. So the, so the full discussion. So it, it, I, I, I don't work with a fully technical reading about how to produce wetlands and, and how that might work and what would be the sort of uh, 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 hydrological operations of producing a, a, a food forest and so on. Rather, I'm trying to work more gesturally with taking the uh, um, taking the uh, the the traces. You know, I don't know if you remember the, the overlaid plan of the city, which had all these green lines going through and had a very specific relationship to the river. So the idea that we are sort of putting forth, or I'm trying to argue in my book, is that we can pick up those old traces and sort of re-inhabit them in a, in, in a way that would produce a, a, maintain a very strong erosion hydrology in, in the site and work with the sedimentation that, that necessarily is produced with that. And then that will start to produce back the forest systems that, you know, that's the natural sort of uh, production of that site. Uh, that's, you know, uh, about as far as we have been able to get. Uh, we kind of jump from there very quickly to a more uh, uh, speculative horizon in, in an exhibition sense, which is to say that from there, what is critical is to ensure, because one of the arguments we have it is with the sort of a highly technolo technolo technologized ecological thinking. You know, you get these people who have got the entire thing figured out, and you just have to follow their directions. And that's one way to do it, I'm sure it is. But the other sort of school of thought also is that we gotta surrender a certain amount of agency and subjectivity. You know, that's the whole Anthropocene argument, which is that there's a problem with thinking that somehow we can engineer this whole thing. So at a certain point, we've got to surrender to those processes, which then therefore, and we see this again and again, we certainly came true in, in COVID, which is that once we start surrendering to these processes, you know, the, the animal agency, the bird agency, the tree agency, uh, you know, everybody's excited about fungal agencies and so on. All these other agencies and the agencies even of living systems uh, like wet, wetlands and so on. These are some things that we are going to have to accept as processes that will have their own, why not, agency and identity, right? So we'll have to enter into them. And we have to perhaps even, if we want to be very speculative, you know, if you read Donna Haraway, uh, enter into uh, working with other consciousnesses. Now, how does one work in that space? All right. I, we have chosen the path of being speculative and open-ended about it and being kind of aesthetic about it. Because often enough, when we talk to the ecology people, they say, well, you don't, you know, I've got a master plan. We really know, we've counted all the numbers. This is how it's done. Uh, but that, you know, is great. But we, we, we don't have a master plan about how you come to a post-human agency. So our hope here is that it becomes more, uh, it's more exhibition level, which is to say, you know, it might look like this. Uh, we have a thing called, uh, if you go to our website, we have a thing which we call the beastie 
which is sort of a, a machine, which is part human, part fungal, part forest, part uh, octopus, part, uh, part tree, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but but we, that's the sort of uh, uh, aspiration of that project. Yes? So I've always had sort of an abiding interest in artist studios. So your third project really um, stuck a chord. Um, if you look at artist studios, um, contemporary artists, of which I have uh, had an opportunity to visit several of them uh, for various projects. I think because contemporary art has now entered a production mode where every couple of years an artist has a show to sell, the nature of that artist studio versus someone like your dad's is completely different. Mm. And among the Indian progressive artists, I've had the chance to visit the artist studio, one of the progressives. I wish I could have... You're talking about the 50s progressives? Like, yes, yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. I wish I could have seen more of the progressives yeah. artist yeah. studio because I think this, this quality of an artist studio yeah. um, is, 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 uh, is something you miss, you don't see anymore in, in the contemporary uh, studios, so to speak. But now let's talk about the preservation or how do you translate your dad's studio into something else? Like, you know, a few, you sort of take it into the future, but sort of borrowed uh, from the past. I, would, I wanted, to, when, while you were presenting, I was thinking of the Burganov studio. He's a sculptor from Russia. So I accidentally happened to walk into, there's a museum, his house is a museum. So I was on Arbat Street and I accidentally walked into the actual original workshop where Burganov worked when he was alive. And what really transported me was the particulate nature of that studio. You could, you could, and that's when, when you mentioned the ethics of dust, that yeah. really caught my attention. Right. I, I was like in a, in a particle sphere in that studio. I could smell the plaster, the, the, the ceramic. The, it, was, it was incredible. It was really like transporting myself. The other reference that came to my head was um, last year when I was, I went to the Atelier Brancusi next to the Pompidou. Mm. You know, they've moved all of Brancusi stuff. I came away disappointed because it was very sterile. Yeah, yeah, yeah cleaned up. And so, when you look yeah. at Brancusi's original studios, the photographs, the documentation, and you see this, uh, it, it kind of, in, in my view, it's, it's exciting for Brancusi enthusiasts, but it's also a dead space. So I think what excites me about the rendering that I have, that you have here now with uh, you collaborating with Jorge, is the fact that the age, uh, the olfactory qualities, the, you know, all the sensorial stuff that goes with these kind of studios. Um, I mean, this is a first idea you guys are discussing, yeah, but I is, think yeah. it's all already very encouraging because it, it doesn't have that sterility, which just, you know, so, um, I mean, really, I'm, I'm very curious to see how this evolves. So. Thank you, thank you so very much for that. Yeah, because, um, uh, I went to Jorge with the reverse intention. I was like, oh my God, I gotta preserve this somehow. Do you have any good ideas since you're the preservation guru here? Uh, and I was very excited uh, uh, that he proposed this sort of way of working. And I'm, I'm now thinking actively the olfactory thing that you mentioned. This process, the thing is, you're absolutely right, you know, and I'm uh, and I'm and I'm transporting myself. That's why my, uh, you know, to two days ago when I was in the studio, and there was all this dust, and we were cleaning it up. We were moving some tables around, and there's this very distinct smell about the place. And now I'm thinking because I know this chemicals that 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 he uses. This they have their own smell, and and a pretty significant uh, smell. And how are those two smells going to uh, work together? And I wonder what happens if we hang this up in a gallery, and how do we, uh, how does one uh, maintain that or produce it? Uh, this olfactory dimension is not something I've thought about at all, and it's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I need to. Uh, we have to talk. Uh, I'm not an art person, so uh, this is a lot of this is new uh, for me. But I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, 
that you think that this is a good way to do it? Because I'm really worried, you know, the, a lot of the um, art people are going to say you destroyed it. Uh, thank you. Am I allowed to ask off topic, which is out of three case studies? Go ahead, yes. All right. So, uh, sir, I'm a user experience designer, and you being a teacher, what I want to understand, uh, currently, uh, uh, you know, young generations, I have two kids, two boys, they are heavily uh, using digital products, a lot of apps. We are dependent on our smartphones. Uh, uh, our day-to-day -day living is based on these digital products, how they function, how we use. Um, what do you see, um, you know, but when I walk into my flat, I see my user experience from a digital experience, digital product to a physical product is not as great. Maybe how the architect or the builder who has designed the house and who created it is not. So in, 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 uh, in your school, in study, how you see that, you know, the f uh, digital transformation of product which you, you're using and very good products, be it any apps like Uber in India, Ola, or Instagram, how that thinking is impacting uh, modern day uh, architectural practice, interior design, or physical products like furnitures. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a big question everywhere, right? I mean, what is the impact of the entire digital universe or virtual reality, now augmented reality, uh, on, on the real world? Um, I want to not see again, like I said, this animation. I learned about this, I, you know, supposedly there's a LiDAR in every new iPhone, right? And supposedly there's this, I just learned about this app three days ago. And we were able to produce this amazing scan of that space in about 77 seconds or you know, maybe, okay, seven minutes. So why bother with the question of digital impact on reality and reality's impact on digital? Now, I'm aware at a certain sociological level that this is a very important question. Students have stopped coming to studios. Half the people don't want to come to lectures because they are asking you, why don't you have, why don't you have it on Zoom, which has its positives and negatives. And, and, and that's a complex thing that's been working out at a political and economic level. You know, office spaces are getting empty. You know, real estate is falling uh, all, all over the country. I'm talking US. I don't know. I presume it's something similar here. So there's a whole social, political, economic conversation. But you asked me as an academic, as a thinker, as a sort of a producer of, uh, of ideas. And from my perspective, you know, these, this, is, this is simply an epistemology. All right? It has never been outside epistemology. And it is, a, and it is connected to reality, ontology, in the very same way. So the question is not, it, 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 it's the same question, you know, when the printing press was introduced, when writing was introduced. So it, it just, got, and I'm not saying, making the argument, you know, technology is always in advance or anything like that. You know from my, all my conversations, I'm not a simple uh, forwardist. But the question must be displaced about the impact of the digital on the real and simply be moved in the direction of you know, what is the new real that is operating in these circumstances. Because the digital is not not real. It's a marketing idea to think that it's not real. It is real. There's nothing non-real about it. So it's a, you know, it's a different question at a different lecture, but, uh, uh, but uh, from an academic perspective, that's what it is, which is very different, I acknowledge, from the sort of real-world impacts that we are experiencing, particularly post-COVID, which is having you know, massive impact on the future of uh, downtown, at least in the United States. Uh, yeah, so 
Uh, that's how I would approach it. Maybe your question was, you know, how do we reach the young kids? Uh, and that's a different question all, altogether. Uh, yes. OK, uh, thank you for uh, introducing us to this newer imagination of what an authorship can be, or you know, at least it's a start. But uh, I was a little curious, like because this was placed under a particular shape of time, which is modernism and Chandigarh in context, and you know, a certain thing in context. Uh, I'm curious to know what would be your opinion on something like a Chanapatna toy. Say that again. There is a Chanapatna toy. Uh, I, I don't know. Chanapatna toys are like toys which were sort of like. Uh, uh, what do you, are they geotagged? I don't know what, you know. I know right geotagging, sorry. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, it was sort of like patronaged by Tipu Sultan and there have been, it's like a living tradition of making toys in a particular way. Uh, I just want to know like, what would be your opinion on authorship in those kind of lived or continuous traditions? To be honest, I don't know what your specific example, but you know, some of the concepts that I'm putting forward very tie, very, uh, I think, and, you know, ESTE conferences, some of the idea, International Association of Study of Traditional Environments, where I've presented these things, uh, are, are exactly the dynamics of what we call tradition, right? And that is something to be reproduced, not as the other to the author, authored work. You know, many times when I'm showing slides of, I don't know, miniatures or something in my class, they say, who was the author? Why don't you put, you, you forgot to put the author on the slide? And you know, it goes down that discussion, classic yeah. discussion of the 19th and early 20th century. So I feel that, uh, 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 long story short, that the kind of, uh, which is not to say, the idea wouldn't be to erase authorship completely mm. in the modern sense and the Western modern sense, if, if you acknowledge that as Western. Yeah. Uh, but to sort of reproduce it in some other way. I mean, it might come down to the very specific of when you put up something, what do you put underneath in the exhibition panel? Right? So Phantom Hands has chairs outside, and they say, da 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 da, Aditya Prakash collection. You know, the status of that is very actually complicated. And something that has to be worked on in the future, not something that is pre-calibrated with a certain political agenda. Thank you. Thank you. The <clears throat> modernism that gave birth to events like Chandigarh started off as a rebellion against a classicism that was a mask for elitism, a classicism that suppressed a whole realm of possibilities to so many people. So it really started off as an ethical project, calling for, a, which really seemed to actually call for a grounded ethics of recognition, a politics of recognition. But it unfortunately degenerated into an aesthetic project. Uh, so if we start talking about these issues at the realm of ideas, are we perpetuating that error? And should we seek to go back to that grounded ethics of recognition that it should have been part of the original call? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I follow, follow your argument, Prem, uh, that, uh, you know, which is that uh, uh, an ethics of the ordinary was uh, uh, appropriated into an aesthetic of high culture. Right? And, and that is the logic at work, I think, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the sales in Sadhavi, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm trying to, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think you are describing my argument as, as reallocating the work back to a sort of a rarefied aesthetic. Ide ideation. Is that, is that what you're saying? And I would argue, no. What I'm saying is that the starting point should really be a grounded ethics of recognition, and then uh, the realm of idea should evolve from there. But 
we, we seem to be tackling these issues at the starting point is the realm of ideas. Yeah. I mean, I think the whole conversation on authorship is exactly that conversation, is it not? It is sort of a grounded idea of recognition, but not a grounded idea of recognition, which works in a simple, uh, in, 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 in an old modernist way of thinking of tradition and the proletariat and the ordinary as something that is to be non, uh, that is uh, anonymous to a certain extent. I mean, we have to undo the opposition between anonymous and authored. You know, those are not opposite things. Those are both fictions, right? There has to be some other way to think this. And that other way of thinking is this river system that I, I, you know, I, I try to articulate, in which a certain amount of agency and authorship is retained, but retained in a frame where its location within a broader sub in a broader context is, is not just a reference, but is an integral part of that claim. Hi, uh, it's not a question, just a comment. I mean, uh, what was interesting for me is that in your practice, uh, looking at residue, where the idea of the idea of residue, whether it's material, conceptual, artistic, design, ecological, residue uh, and how this sort of holds scope for a reimagination of practice, authorship and ideas of future imagination was something that was interesting for me. Okay. And I think uh, um, to not look at re residue as something that is, uh, that is stagnant, but yeah. that is potent, right. that is, uh, that is uh, morphing, that can have the space to morph and change. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I mean, by residue, you mean sort of layering upon things, you know, for instance, the dust, for instance, the, the sand, for instance, the yeah. sedimentation, and so on and so forth. Or yeah. Even or even the blueprint of the plan. Yeah, I mean, this is an idea which has had been around a little bit. I mean, if you know Motion's work in, uh, uh, at Harvard and uh, David Leatherborough's work at UPenn, and they've been working on all these things for, for a while. Uh, but they work at, come, at, come at this from a more aesthetic perspective. Uh, the question is how to move, uh, uh, move the idea of residue as not something that is added on to an original, but includes the original in part of its productive practice. And I think that's, a, for me, a fascinating uh, a theoretical departure as a theorist, which, which, which we try and produce now through our uh, conceptual practice, uh, which I think, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting in, you know, even in um, uh, places like India, you know, I'm thinking of the old British complaining about heat and dust. You know, we have this idea much more strongly in place. In, uh, uh, however, you know, it has its, uh, you know, like with COVID, one of the great advantages was, you know, everything cleaned up, all the dust and the, the haze. It was wonderful, wasn't it? Uh, uh, so how do you, it's not something to be unilaterally kind of, uh, um, it has a, in a different registers, in particularly through uh, invisible registers with methane, carbon, and so on. It's also a highly dangerous thing. So, uh, one has to work case by case to a certain extent. Thank, thank you for your presentation, sir. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, one of the last comments that you had in the presentation was, you should not be the originator of uh, preservation practices. So, so what do you think should the direct, uh, since I'm an architect, I would like to ask an architectural question in this context. So what do you think should be the direction of uh, adaptive reuse of uh, buildings, since that has been such a standard practice ever since uh, Scarpa's Castle Vecchio or uh, Ando's Venice building or Chipperfield's project? Yeah, wh what does one think adaptive practice in this context is a very interesting question. And, and, and we, have a, we have a professor who works entirely on adaptive practice at, at our university. And, 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 uh, and on the one hand, she will always claim, well, this, what you're saying is nothing new. We have been doing this forever. This is what adaptive, adaptive reuse is all about. Uh, uh, and I think that that's a reasonable enough uh, argument. 
except that my argument with a lot of adaptive reuse as a, as a, as an aesthetic practice, at least as as it's you're taking Castle Vecchio, right? Yeah. I mean, classic Scarpa adaptive reuse uh, shining icon. Is that it? It I love it. Okay, so I'm I'm not trying to. It's a beautiful work. Uh, so how do you see the, that the, the, the gap between the old wall and the new wall? And then how do you see the glass on top? You know, it's a matter of reading. Now, if you read that gap, and if you read that glass in Castel Vecchio as othering the wall, I think that's very problematic. If you read that glass and that gap as that's history and this is modernity, then that's very problematic. And if you read a lot of literature from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s, that's more or less how they read Castle Vecchio. But if you try and read, now, so there is a problem with that. And I would, I'm not sure how Carlos Scarpa would have read it. But I think it is OK for us to misread it, actively misread it, as a, as a layering on. All right, as a palimpsesting, as a, as a layering on, in which case it offers itself up to productive readings. Now, the problem with Castle Vecchio is it's stuck. They, it's, they maintain it like perfectly like that, like a uh, you know, piece of pearl. And what we do, you know, there is no further layering. Uh, it's kind of frozen. Fortunately, it's gorgeous, so that's fine. But that's not a productive thing for, for those of us who work every day. So in that sense, adaptive reuse is a much more interesting argument, where there's this constant layering onto, onto it. Now, problem with adaptive reuse is it completely works. It's, it's very opportunistic, all right? And which is fine, you know? This was this, that per function is gone. Now we're going to completely redo it, and we've done a brilliant job. OK, that works very well very often, which is great. But I think it, 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 it has a, you know, how, you know uh, what I'm trying to do is, is to sort of re-theorize the idea of fidelity of preservation into a mold, bring it into this conversation, which is not, you know, completely uh, uh, ransomed to the uh, uh, ex exigency of new pur purpose and function. So look, it's, it's, some of these things are open-ended. You know, I'm just thinking this through. This is, uh, I'm learning as I'm doing. Uh, 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 but, I, but I do want to say, I did not say we as architects shouldn't do, I didn't, I said, I said, you know, sometimes preservation is really the good thing to do because it's a good thing to do. You know, there are certain specific examples, et cetera, you know, that's, that's really good. I'm talking about a more generalized practice. When it comes to a place like Chandigarh, you know, where there is furniture by the thousands, where there's so many buildings, so much modernism, you know, we should sort of put them in a freezer. But uh, for the rest of us, we need a more uh, active agency. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to bring it, uh, like, circle back to Chandigarh in a way. Um, so I was just thinking, you know, what we were talking about seems so divorced from the ground reality of Chandigarh. And perhaps what happens in Chandigarh is part of the reason why we're having um, this conversation. So how does this, like, how do we, in a way, move this um, conversation to Chandigarh? Like, how, or, um, like, how does that transformation begin to happen on the ground? Um, so that what, uh, uh, what you were theorizing as uh, preser active preservation, mm. um, how does that start to come into practice there? Yeah. Uh. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by it doesn't exist in Chandigarh. I mean, it depends on how you read it. Uh, it's true. We don't have a Bangalore Chandigarh International Center. Uh, we, maybe we need a Chandigarh International Center. And we need kind of 
uh, uh, that uh, sort of uh, engagement with discourse. In a different register, everything that I've talked about has come out of Chandigarh. So in, the se in that sense, uh, Prem talked about, you know, the sort of nationalist in, 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 in nation state investment that was put into Chandigarh was so huge. It is such a deep treasure that it keeps yielding like a kalash, uh, you know, regardless of, uh, of its custodians and, and speakers. You, can, you just walk, walk anywhere in Chandigarh and it's like, wow, all these questions and con conversations and things and things to be talking about. So, but more pragmatically, yeah, I mean, I think uh, 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 we have to develop uh, these kind of local institutions over there, all right? The entire conversation is hijacked by the chairs and the UNESCO uh, nomination, which is fine. You know, the UNESCO nomination is very good and important, and thank God, because of that, we can tell the chief minister, no, we need that to act, you know, go to see the assembly building. We are architects, so I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. But, it, it, it's, but the, the, the living conversation has to be unfrozen into discourses. And for that, we need institutions. And institutions that are living, and uh, hopefully the uh, Aditya Prakash house, which you know, is our father's house, which we built on, which we have just sold to the very young man who's asking me this question, uh, can continue that. So I'm, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm so sorry that we have one more question, but we do have to wrap up here, but I think we can take ourselves outside and continue the conversation. I'm so sorry to cut you off, um, but we, yes, we will head outside. We will continue our conversations there. Thank you so much for this. Thanks, it's Nina. Fantastic. And, um, and I, I do want to do one small plug if it's not um, too much, but we have a design history series also running this year. It's also supported by Phantom Hands. And I believe that if you were interested to come today, you'll also find that really fascinating. And I invite you to join us for that going forward this year. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>